Is it like just like what? It's not just peanut butter. What else is in it? Okay, like a Reese's hang, Pieces. Hang, hang on one second. Okay, I'm gonna. You, you're gonna be able to see this live. Hang okay. On. Okay. Welcome to Cue the Mic. Welcome back, guys. Episode 27. 27. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. We're back from the Jack, back from the Jack Daniels World Championship. If you didn't get a chance to listen to uh, this week's episode, episode 26, it... It was interesting. Was... It's probably it's probably better to go to YouTube and watch that mm-hmm. one than it is to listen to it if you get yeah. a chance because mm-hmm. it's you know, a lot. It just it was just trying to you know we had the famous Johnny Trigg, the Godfather of Barbecue, popped in mm-hmm. unexpectedly, so we put him on camera, and then we had Blaine from Porky Butts, and then things really went to the shitter. Literally, literally, literally. But lots of yeah. lots of fun. But Johnny Johnny just says what's on his mind, and so yeah, he really does. <laughs> it's a lot like you, and he and he means every bit of it. So uh-huh. yeah, he's uh, but an iconic guy in the world of barbecue. Mm-hmm. And at eighty four years old, we're still blessed to to have him and and have him around and competing and just enjoying life. So. He's just as grumbly as he ever was. You know, we've known Johnny mm-hmm. for 20 some years. And so he's just as grumbly as he ever was, but he's still, uh, we're just proud to call him good friends. And so with him and Trish, it was just lots of, lots of fun. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely go listen to that. It's just from yeah. the Jack. Yeah. Watch it. Episode from the 26. Jack. Mm-hmm. But not, home from the Jack, long track home on Sunday. Didn't get any calls mm-hmm. at the Jack, but that's okay. We still had fun. You know, we really um, didn't cook that well for some reason. Just just made little, I don't know. I just was not on my A game for some reason at the Jack. And I probably should have been. But then again, people like, I kind of got this lazid, lack, lackadaisical attitude about just, hey, I'm there to have fun. It's all about the adventure and, and the adventure we had. We had we had fun. It was beautiful weather. But when it came down to cooking, it was just like, Sherry's like, yeah, you kind of changed some things up a little bit, you know, at the last mm-hmm. minute. So probably things I shouldn't done. But, you know, everybody was calling me saying, wow, did you see that chicken table you hit? You know, you got 64th in chicken and first on the table was 50th. Well, yeah, I said, well, 64th was probably a pretty fair assessment of my chicken. You know, I, I ran it on a cooker. I wasn't paying as much attention as I should be. I got behind. I really had to switch it to another cooker. And I'm cooking chicken at 400 degrees, rushing to get it done. And I had this whole plan of what I wanted to do. And that all went to shit because the chicken wasn't done. And so when the chicken's not done, it's hard to finish the chicken the way I wanted it to finish. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just things happen. You know, my my ribs were a little tight, which sometimes they got 18th. And, you know, sometimes you get lucky with a tight rib. My pork was a little tight. Um, and my brisket, I thought, was amazing. So, what, Emma? You can't you, you, you can't talk about pork being tight? It was just the, I'm an immature child. <laughs> and when you said tight rib, I just, it just really threw me. I'm fine. Continue. Sorry. <laughs> a tight, a tight, tight. rib. Is yeah. that something they say in no, the gym no. or what? No, no, no. It just no. I yep. No, it's fine. It's a whole thing. <laughs> yep, anyway. it was a tight rib, but brisket was brisket was amazing. I probably made a mistake. I cooked two two brisket flats. I didn't have any points that were they were way too marbled. So I said I'm not going to cook, but I was going to cook. I had two flats that were halfway decent, so I cooked one. I probably turned in the wrong one. Because the one that everybody tried was the one I didn't turn in. They're like, oh, my God, this is amazing. And I'm like, oh, shit, turned in the wrong one. So, but anyway, such is is life. We had fun. We got to celebrate 
you know, some of our friends got big calls to the stages. Some of, uh, some, I don't want to say the newcomers, but, you know, some people had only been to the Jack two or three times. Uh, one, the team that took reserve, BMAC, and out of, out of California, I think it was their first time to the Jack. So, oh, wow. um, yeah. So anyway, we were excited for them just like we had won. You know, mm-hmm. so we got to congratulate them on the way to stage and hang out and talk a little bit. And so, um, it was, it was a lot of fun. We had an overall a lot of fun, long trip home on Saturday mm-hmm. or Sunday. Um, uh, just, you know, it's just a, a grind, you know, awards. They wanted to make sure after the Royal debacle that the awards were correct. So they made them audit the scores four times. So the five o'clock awards turned into five thirty, five forty five awards. And then, I mean, we're finishing up awards. It was like eight, eight thirty at night and we still got three or four hours we need to drive. So it was a, it was a late night, but mm-hmm. nonetheless, we're back. We're recovering. We're getting some good night's sleep. And so now I'm trying to, I think we got the big barbecue trailer sold. So I'm um, trying to get it unloaded and the pit off and everything so that we can get ready for a new trailer to come in and start the next season with. Haven't you had that trailer for a long time? Yeah, 10 years. Wow. End of an era. 10 air. years. But, you know, we decided we need a little bit uh, more comfort. Sherry's, you know, in a gooseneck. The bed's up in the gooseneck. And it's, with her knee, it's getting harder and harder for her to get in and out of bed. And it's not really that easy for me. Um, So we decided to kind of move to the motorhome, pull in a trailer. So we got a motorhome and we're working on a trailer and probably going to build another trailer for next year. And and off we go with a different setup. Time to go. Times are changing. Actually, we just want some more creature comforts at home. And and more importantly, when Griffin and Henley start going, we got a place that they can go run around. And when mm-hmm. we're not competing, we can maybe take one of them or two of them go camping and do some fun things. So, Yeah, good investment. Multi, multi-purpose. Yeah. Good deal. So anyway, so now we're... So- uh, now we're back. Now we're yeah. trying to get ready. The first thing you hit you in the face after the jack every year is is holiday meats. Yeah. Well, first you walk in the back door and find out what's broke. And I got one smoker that I worked on for a few hours yesterday just trying to figure out. We got, we got an airflow problem. Something's not something's not burning right. So when I've still got it, it's mm. just taking too long to cook. The temperature's fine, but I don't have some airflow. So I was on huh. the phone with old Hickory yesterday trying to troubleshoot everything, which I had already troubleshooted. So we're going to have to tear it down deep and trying to figure out, do I have something a little off? So, but it's hard to do when smokers run 24-7. It's hard to, especially this time yeah. of year with catering is crazy just trying to find time to take down a smoker for three or four hours so that i can work on it so yeah but we'll get her done that's on the agenda for the rest of the week so but then that holiday meets just hopefully we'll holiday have that meets. out and for those that don't know i mean we holiday meet time is a huge huge mm-hmm. uh year i mean i think last year we did 342 mm-hmm. holiday meat orders and yeah. an order may be a turkey or a ham or it may be a full meal or dinner sliced turkey and ham and so it's just crazy and people are chomping at the bit you know the early some people have been calling se- september 1st as soon as they heard the word mm-hmm. fall they start thinking about it but the majority of the people wait oh, until no. the day before thanksgiving and hey can i yeah. get a turkey no no You know, so we try and, you know, get the stuff out as early as possible, which we've got a month before cutoff. So it's good timing to get it out. But, of course, with that, we have all the, you know, not only do you have to get the menus out, but you got to get the online ordering all set up. you got to... um, Promote gotta it. get all our st- inside. We got to promote it. We got to get the processes mm-hmm. down and everything. We've been doing yeah. it for a long time, but every year we have some different kinks yeah. um, that are thrown in the puzzle, and we're trying to make things better. And and this year we got different size yeah. turkeys. You know, last year mm-hmm. always our turkeys were too small at twelve to fourteen pound. Last year we came in at sixteen to twenties. They were too big of turkeys. They took too long to cook. And so now this year we're 
got our ultimate 14 to 16 pound birds coming in. So, but limited supply. As so, always. As always. So we got to get people on the, get this out there so they can get on the stick. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah. But holiday meets. Holiday meets. So a, a lot of questions that we get, and I know we've covered some of this in the past, but yeah, a lot of questions we get is how much meat, how much and I thought maybe we could start there, you know, is mm-hmm. because I did some yield testing myself on turkeys last year because people buy a whole turkey. When I say I buy a 15 pound turkey, well, when I did the yield testing on it, people would be surprised that because really what I what people need to know is, hey, I've got a, a 14 pound turkey or a 15 pound turkey. How mm-hmm. many people will that feed? You know, and right. like in normal catering, you know, the everything will jump. It, you know, a third of a pound is kind of a normal serving. If you've got some heavy eaters, a half of a pound. So we try and get everything down to ounces. So, mm-hmm. you know, you're somewhere between five to eight ounces is a typical serving. But when you look at kids, you know, you got to look at kids because kids don't eat as much. Mm-hmm. And some teenagers eat a bunch. Um, yeah. You kind of got to look at your guest list, which is probably easier from a Thanksgiving standpoint because you know who they are. You know yeah. that Uncle Johnny's going to be eat a pound of turkey, and you know that you know somebody else is just going to put a little on their plate. So, you know, the way to do that is just kind of add up ounces, right? So, a, a small eater is going to eat four ounces. A big eater is going to eat a half a pound. You know, and so you right. start adding those up. 16 ounces a pound, and then you figure out, okay. Now, of all the yield testing I've done on turkey, 32% is my number. And and I know as a smaller turkey will yield a little bit better than that, but those bigger birds that we did last year yielded 32%. So that means if I take a 15-pound turkey, Mm -hmm. okay, and I'm going to get my calculator out here, but if we do a 15-ounce turkey times 32%, that's 4.8 pounds of meat. Okay? Mm-hmm. So 4.8 pounds of meat out of a 15-pound bird. Now, you may get five, five and a half. You may get a little less. But, you know, I, I'm going to say that 15-pound bird, just rough average, is going to give you five pounds of meat. So when you talk mm-hmm. about five pounds of meat, 16 ounces in a pound, that's 80 ounces. And then you can start going to your less guest list and say, okay, if... Maybe five ounces is, you know, a, a great number. You know, it's not the smallest portion, but it's kind of a nice balance. That means that's going to get about 16 people out of that out of that bird. You know, so I think that's what you have to look at. And most people in the, you know, in the regular thing going, how much do I need? How much do I need? Yeah. Well, just kind of figure what it's going to yield. You know, I like 32% mm-hmm. as a number um, from a turkey because we cook a lot of turkeys and we've pulled a lot of turkeys and just cooking them. And, and you may get higher if you're injecting it and putting a lot of stuff in that turkey. You may gain some weight there and you may get up to six pounds out of that 15 pound bird. But on average, you're probably going to get close to five pounds. Get her into ounces, figure out how many ounces per pound, you know. Um, a, a very small eater is going to eat four ounces. A big eater is going to eat eight ounces and just kind of figure out what that is. And, you know, from a turkey standpoint, ham's kind of a different story. Um, yeah. we actually do a boneless ham. Yeah. Um, it's actually a, a real, it's a very good Smithfield ham that they've mechanically pulled the bone out of and then pressed. So it's still got all that beautiful intermuscular fat mm-hmm. um, that comes with the ham. So it's not a it's not a processed chopped ham that's actually had you know they just put it in a chopper and then they put it in a press and form it together and it is the same exact thing. It's actually a really nice bone in ham that's had the bone removed. Mm-hmm. And when we're figuring ba- ham, you know, when you cook that ham, you know, we're going to probably lose 80% of it. So if I, or I'm going to lose 20% of it just in 
water weight of the ham cooking out. So if I'm cooking a 10 pound ham, I'm going to have eight pounds of ham on a boneless ham. But mm -hmm. what's probably easier on the ham is, and, and all the research I do says, hey, on a boneless ham, you need a third pound of meat. On a bone in ham, you need a half pound of meat, you know, per person. So a 10 pound ham bone in will feed, you know, 10, half pound, is going to feed 20 people on a 10 pound ham, where <laughs> it's going to feed almost 30 people on a boneless ham. Okay. Does that make sense? I think so. So anyway, try and get that portion size. If you have no clue, work five to six ounces, 16 ounces in a pound, five to six ounces. Mm -hmm. Make sure you forget that you're going to lose some of it when you cook it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, all that all that juice in the bottom of the the pan is weight, you know, so you just got to mm -hmm. pay attention to yields. And that's that's true with briskets and if you're doing pork butts and everything else. I mean, full briskets probably yield 35% by the time you trim all the fat off of them and stuff. A pork butt is around average 50%. You might get 55% out of a pork butt, but, you know, you're going to lose half of it in the smoker. I mean, that's the problem with the barbecue world. That's why mm -hmm. barbecue is so expensive because whatever you're paying in price, you're only going to be able to serve half of it. So if you got comments about, you know, turkeys and hams and portions and what to serve, you know, leave it, leave us in the comments. Yep. Leave them quick though, because Emma's on her way overseas. Oh, I wasn't sure where you're going with that. I am on my way overseas. She gets but to go to Italy. Italy. Yes. Italy. I wonder if yeah. she'll bring me back a present. Probably will. Actually, I probably won't. <laughs> I don't even think I brought my mom back a present last time. Yeah, that's okay. I'm not big into presents. But anyway, so c continuing on with our, our conversation, because mm -hmm. it, like any caterings, holiday meals are the same exact thing. We're going to follow rules. We're going to follow rules that say if you're serving potatoes or mac and cheese, you're probably going to serve six ounces. Mm -hmm. Okay. So once again, simple math for everybody, 16 ounces in a pound, six ounces per portion. Okay. So, and you can, you can increase those or decrease those, but that's going to give you enough that you're not going to run out. Now pay attention. If you got kids, Kids aren't going to eat as much, so right. kind of throw them off to the side or take them totally out of the equation because you're probably going to make them chicken nuggets anyway, right? Or <laughs> something like that. I mean, that's I the way it works. I was always told I just have to eat what's given or eat what's in front of me. Well, yeah, but when you got the two and three and four year olds running around, I guess maybe you're going to make them chicken nuggets or mac and cheese. So. You know, just yeah, kind of potato. remember that as you go into the portions. But when you're talking vegetables, you're talking three ounces a person. But the, the, one of the things you got to remember, and also when the catering standpoint is that try and put everything on a plate. You know, mm -hmm. so if you take your take your five or six ounces of turkey or three ounces of turkey and three ounces of ham, because you want to split those numbers if you're yeah. serving both. And mm -hmm. And take your six ounces of mashed potatoes and, you know, gravy. Once again, I'd figure three ounces of gravy, you know, so mm -hmm. think of 32 ounces in a quart of gravy, 16 ounces in a pint. Gosh, so three really? ounces of gravy should give you plenty to put on your potatoes, on your stuffing, and a little on your turkey. So three ounces is probably a pretty solid number. Some people say just a third of a cup per person, gravy. Um and it just depends, right? So oh you got what? I'm thinking about Thanksgiving dinner now. <laughs> I know. I, I'm sitting. I was sitting there thinking about <laughs> sage dressing. You know, my oh gosh, my my, my, my mother in law is not a very good cook, and oh, she knows. And she knows she's not a good cook, right? Yeah. And but her, the one thing that she can make that she nails it every time that I love. Mm -hmm. is sage dressing. Now, mm -hmm. I'll eat sage dressing any different way you want it. Okay, it can be gooey, it can be like <laughs> bread pudding, or it can be... But she, like, overcooks the sage dressing, so it's, like, very... Not dry, but dry. Mm -hmm. And it's so good. 
I mean, just that's one thing that she nails all year long. And, and I, we have dinner at her house every Sunday and I do most of the cooking and sometimes she, but it's like, as the years have went on, the sage dressing is the daddy O. And so it's like, Hey, you making the dressing, you making the dressing. We like her, we let her make the dressing. It's so Mm -hmm. good that even Sherry likes it. Oh, wow. Which is amazing because Sherry wouldn't normally eat dressing. Right. But it's important, like catering, you know, we have these conversations all the time that um, think of your imaginary plate. You can only fit so much on a plate, yeah. right? So don't do six ounces of mash and six ounces of this and six ounces of this and pretty soon add that up. And are no. people really going to eat three pounds, of, uh, three pounds no. of food? No. No. Now at Thanksgiving, people are probably going to eat a good pound of food, maybe a mm-hmm. pound and a half for the big eaters. Yeah, because some people have more than one in a day even, so... Right. You got to think about that too. And plus you got to save room for dessert. Oh yeah. Pie. Pie. What's your, All the pies. what's your, uh, what's your pie of choice, Emma? Lemon meringue. Lemon meringue. Yeah. It's the only pie I eat actually. Really? Mm-hmm. So. I don't like pumpkin pie. I might have an apple pie. That's it. Lemon meringue and apple, but. I don't do any of the other ones. So, so one of the special things about going to the Jack is mm-hmm. the Jack's only about an hour, hour and a half away from Big Bob Gibson's in Decatur, Alabama. Mm-hmm. And Big Bob Gibson's has the most amazing pies. And their signature pie is a peanut butter pie. Okay. So what? Uh, imagine. Is it like, is it like just. Like what is not just peanut butter? What else is in it? Okay, like a Reese's hang, Pieces. Hang, hang on one second. Okay, I'm gonna. You, you're gonna be able to see this live. Hang okay, on. okay. Well, Darren's getting his pie. What's up, everybody? It's Emma. I'm gonna have a pie. You can talk to it. So I'm. I'm gonna show you this pie. It's. It's. Can you hear you'll it? Be able to get the experience. Oh, of you it. definitely can. Because. <laughs> so okay. check out this pie. Okay. So this pie, this pie is a, is a regular a, crust, and yep. it's got a chunky peanut butter on the on the bottom, like a layer of it. A layer of chunky peanut butter, okay. and then it has a layer of like custard. Yeah, that's what right? it looks like. Yeah. And then this most beautiful meringue. Yeah, that looks delicious. The, the beautiful meringue, and then on top they have toasted peanuts all over yeah, the top. Shavings. So for those of you that are listening to this on Spotify, you really need to go to YouTube and see this pie. Yeah. Because this pie is truly amazing. It looks and good. And so I won't take the time to put it back. I might take the time to get a fork. <laughs> but it yeah. is like the crazy good pie. Yeah, that looks good. It's, yeah. I see. I the I don't I don't know how I feel about custard filling though, and I'm not much of a peanut butter person. Now, if it had like some chocolate and tasted like a Reese's Pieces, I'm game on. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah, if I, don't I, can know. Just do I have to say butter. that 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 Big Bob Gibson's peanut butter pie is probably my all time favorite. It's the pie that you would drive five hours out of the way to eat a slice. Sounds like you do. Well, we actually had Anella from Snake River bought a bunch of pies, right? Mm -hmm. And she she brought them up to us, and then she was kind of distributing them out. But she was at our site, so she had like five or six pies. And of course, I saw the peanut butter and put it in my refrigerator in the front, so everybody would forget about it. Well, everything got into it, and we never had pie. Well, Blaine from Porky Butts, they grabbed one of the pies, thinking they're all peanut butter pies. Mm-hmm. And they get home that night, and they call back and say, "What? What? What the hell? We got lemon meringue." <gasps> that sounds right? like a dream come true. And they're like, they're mad that they didn't have the peanut butter pie. And I said, "Well, uh, I don't see any peanut butter pie, huh? That's interesting." <laughs> well, it was just in the front of my RV in the refrigerator, making this will its be a trip test. back to Iowa. Blaine, so, if you listen, so you good. stole it. I stole it, but that that peanut butter pie, I'm telling you. We got that peanut butter pie last Thursday. Oh, yeah, and that's I holding had, up and well. I, and I had the first slice of it 
mm-hmm. last night. I had the first yeah, two it. slices last night. Don't tell anybody. But it was amazing. I mean, it's yeah. it's like yeah. game changer. Yeah, that's the thing. lemon meringue pie. You kind of have to eat pretty fresh, or it gets weird. Gets yeah. I'm not sure what these they have. These old ladies that come in and make pies every mm-hmm. day. Yeah. So I'm not that's sure what they're what they're do doing. My grandma yeah. makes some mean pies, and then my mom. I don't really eat anybody's pie besides a family member's. My grandma's or my mom's. Yeah. This. We haven't talked about my mom a lot lately, but she used to yeah, be a what, professional what's up baker. With that? She's a professional know. baker. She used to be. She's retired. Yeah. But she's retired. She, she makes some mean pies. But, yeah. What's her best mm-hmm. pie? Lemon meringue. I don't. I don't know. I again. I don't eat very many of them. But I her lemon meringue is my favorite. But she doesn't make it very often. It's kind of it's pretty time consuming. Um, right. She makes a pretty good apple pie though. That's one thing I've never made. I may have I'm, to learn how to make a meringue. I do believe her pumpkin pie is pretty good. And pecan. My brother loves pecan pie, which is not what I, you'd think not if you knew my brother. But I, I, I like pecan pie too. So yeah, that's a big one. know what in your our favorite house. pie is. I feel like we've turned into Leave the, the pie episode. We're just right? talking. Yeah, we really haven't talked just, lately. So we're just talking like we, like we need to. So anyway, but mm-hmm. holiday meals and another thing <laughs> that people ask a lot about uh-huh. is for, and let's switch gears. Kind of related, not related, but the catering, the art of retherm, right? Oh, yeah, because mm-hmm. that's another comment that we get a lot about. Yep. That people want to know how do I do it, and and we'll we'll wind back in time okay so you take us back to 2006 when sherry and i opened Mm -hmm. our first catering business Mm -hmm. it everything we thought everything had to be fresh everything had to be 100 percent fresh and i'm not against having one of everything 100 percent fresh but it's really hard to scale doing that. So, for instance, back then, you know, at five o'clock at night, I'd go to, uh, I'd go to Sam's Club and I'd buy pork butts or I'd buy brisket and I'd go mm-hmm. home and I'd trim them and I'd season them and I'd put them on the smoker, and mm-hmm. they would smoke all night long. I'd get up in the morning, I'd check them, I'd wrap them, and then either I would come home at lunch or Sherry would come home at lunch. And we would pull the pork, put it in a pan. We'd slice the brisket right quick, put it in a pan. We may have in the morning, we may have put beans on the smoker or whatever. And we'd go deliver this over lunch. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did for a year. And that's a great way to do that, except for if you have to have five different events, that's almost impossible. Right. You know, so when I talk to a lot of potential restaurant tours, people that want to be in the catering business or mm-hmm. people that want to be in the uh, restaurant business, catering business, whatever. The whole secret to scaling is the art of retherm. Okay. So right. I take a mentality that we don't serve the best barbecue in the world. Okay. And I'll be the first right. to say this. Mm-hmm. We serve the most consistent barbecue in the world. So what you have to do is you have to figure out how to do that. So if you're making, for instance, with meat, there's multiple ways to do this. Okay, yeah. so you can cook meat ahead of time. Um, some people cryovac it. We cryovac it. Now, according to our health department, we can leave meat in a cryovac for 48 hours without having to have a fancy HACCP plan and a HACCP H A A C P has a plan means I have to monitor every single temperature along the way. So I have to, I have to, when I order it, when pork comes in the door, I have to measure the temp. I have to log it. When the pork comes out and goes in the cooker, I have to log it. When it comes out of the cooker, I have to log it. When I cool it down every two hours, I have to log it. And we have to, it's just the biggest pain in the ass in the world. Yeah. So in order to avoid doing that, Mm -hmm. they said, well, and I found I found it in the code. I found the loophole in the code that says they're worried about different 
I don't want to say botulisms, but organisms, whatever, grow in oxygen-deprived meat packaging. Oh. Oxygen-deprived packaging, which means vacuum sealing. Mm -hmm. Now, do I believe that? Hmm, I'm not sure that that many things grow, but the scientists do it. So, But they don't start to grow until 48 hours. Mm -hmm. So we have a deal with our health department that every catering that we do, like our normal process today is pork is coming out of the cooker this morning. Mm -hmm. We're going to process it. We're going to pool it. We're going to cool it down. Okay. And we have big blast chillers to do this. So we're, we're very efficient in getting thousands, hundreds, if not thousands of pounds of meat cooled down within two hours. Okay. So that's a big challenge for a lot of people that don't have that type of equipment. So mm -hmm. they're either putting it in a bag, in a cooler, trying to get it cooled down or trying to put it in a refrigerator, commercial refrigerator. Somehow in order to be safe for the customer, you got to get that below 40 degrees in four hours. Right. Okay. Very tough in a small operation. Okay. Yeah. Very tough to do. Whether, you know, most people would just say, you know, throw it in a Ziploc bag and throw it in an ice bath and get it cooled down. That's probably going to be as efficient as you could be um, to get it cooled down. You can't just go take 20 pounds of pork and throw it in your refrigerator at home because it would be 24 hours by the time that got cooled down. And it's hard to even do that in a commercial refrigeration. Now, if you have a walk in cooler, you can get it almost done by then, but it's still not going to be fast enough for food safety. And that's numero mm -hmm. uno when it comes to serving customers is food safety. Don't want anybody getting sick. You read about that all the time. You re re read about people getting sick. So you got to cool down the meat. You got to vacuum seal it. So some people reheat it. Some people will take out pork, pull it, put it in a pan. And they will put um, saran wrap over the pan and kind of suck it down because air is your problem, okay? It's not about, when it comes to reheating stuff, air is your biggest problem. Mm -hmm. So if you take the air out and can get it cooled down, so let's say you got a half pan of pork and you put a piece of saran wrap and kind of create a seal and then mm -hmm. cover that up, then when you go to retherm it, then there's no air, and so the pork's going to maintain its pink color and everything. Same with brisket, same with everything else. It's just going to be better. Mm -hmm. So the key is you've got to figure out how to do that. And Thanksgiving's one of those things. We've found mm -hmm. that people only have so much oven space, right? So you right. need to be able to be creative when it comes to Thanksgiving. So you got to figure out what's going to take the longest and what's going to hold the longest. So as you're making your mashed potatoes, mashed potatoes could sit on the counter for an hour, two hours, and they'd be fine, right? Cover them up, keep them warm, whatever. But some of the vegetable stuff you want done right away. So it's all a matter of timing. There's probably mm -hmm. a whole episode there on the timing of a Thanksgiving meal. But your meat's going to be just fine. When that turkey gets done, that turkey can get done and go in a cooler, no ice, with some towels and sit there for three, four, five hours, and it's just going to make that turkey better. Same with huh. your ham, you know. So if you got a chance to hold it, I feel like we're kind of bouncing around there, but this whole you've got to figure out your system on how you do it. If you're mm -hmm. going to make beans, you don't want to make beans by the pan. You want to make enough, a big batch of beans. Even if you're not going to use them all for two or three days, it's fine. It's just beans. Same mm -hmm. with potato casserole, right? So potato casserole, you got to, or a cheesy potato or something, don't try and make one pan. Try and make a batch. And then you're yeah. just portioning them out and going. So that's going to, you know, that's going to be the key. If you ever want to grow the catering business, that's going to be a, a key is you got to figure out how to retherm and how to retherm effectively. Whether if your health department allows Kravac, I know, I know people that cook pork or brisket and slice mm -hmm. it, cool it down, cryovac it, and put it in the freezer. Right. And then the, day, then the day before they are going to serve it to a customer, they take it out of the freezer, they put it in there. Are we keeping you up, Emma? I saw That's, that, Jan. It's fine. Yeah, this is interesting. Sorry. But really so, so they'll freeze it, they'll take it out, and they'll thaw it out, and then you can take that cryovac bag and you can wrap it in a piece of tinfoil, put it in an oven or a smoker for 250 degrees, and cook it for about two and a half hours. 
and you take it out. If it's frozen, probably gonna take a little bit more, but take it out. And I guarantee that CryoVac method, if your health department will let you get away with it, is going to be the most effective and most consistent way that you can cater. I mean, mm -hmm. we've built a $3 million catering business on cryovac meat and making the sides the day before and heating them up the next day, right? Now, if we were just going to slice brisket to order and pulled pork and chicken, there's no way you could ever do the amount of business that we do. So even though you're small, you need to think about it because if you have any intentions of growing, any intentions at all of growing, you've got to figure out how to be consistent from day one. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is the entire secret to going a catering business. I see so many guys that are like, how can I, I can only cook this much meat. You know, I can't cook. I need to serve 500 and I only have enough capacity to serve 400. Well, that's okay. Cook it all for two two or three days ahead of time, get it cooled down and then retherm it the day of the event and you're going to be great and everything's going to be consistent and the same. Right on. Right on. Anything right else on. we didn't, anything else we didn't cover there? Actually, no, because we kind of went off a comment with this whole holiday meets and catering topic, and it looks like you hit all of his questions. It's Thanks. just, it's just, Big it's O's just Backyard portions, Barbecue. Right? It, who was it? It was Big O's Backyard Barbecue. Yeah. He commented yeah. on YouTube. Well, that's the, the that's the people I'm talking to at competitions. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that are yeah. one asking the questions because that's that's really the target of this whole thing. Yeah, this, yeah. this isn't about promotion of Smokey D's or Darren. No. This isn't about Maybe signing on ego. sponsors. We have none. This right. is really about sharing the knowledge that we've learned in the barbecue business over 13 years that allow us to scale our operations and we've made a lot of mistakes over the years but mm -hmm. we're pretty damn good at it now now are we the best barbecue in the world not a chance i can cook but the best barbecue in the world we right? are consistent but we are very consistent and that's the key to anything you do so you know if, if you're open into catering business find the bun find the, the bun that you're going to serve Put the amount of meat that you think is going to look good on that bun, and there's your portion size of meat. If there's too much meat, get a smaller bun, right? But find your bun and use that bun every single time. If you have a recipe, don't throw out random barbecue sauces that people gave you as samples and use them. Find a barbecue sauce and use it. Now, you know, if you if you have a commercial barbecue sauce you like, or if you're interested in Smokey D's barbecue sauce, we unlabel it. We'll put our label on any barbecue sauce. So if you want if you want to, you know, have a whole line of mild, sassy, fiery barbecue sauces, I'll sell you sauces and you buy a label and put over the top of it and now you have your own barbecue sauce. That's how the world works. Right? Most not everybody makes their own, and nobody really cares about your grandma's barbecue sauce recipe. If it takes six hours to make, it's not going to be very efficient to use in the catering operation. There's a lot of things that I would love to do from a catering standpoint, but you just yeah. got to make it work. And, you know, the sooner you get over the... Hey, this is a family recipe. It's all about making it easy. You got to make it super, super easy. Because if it's easy, then you can do more and more and more and you can grow your business. And yeah. if you don't want to grow your business, that's fine. You're probably not going to last very long in the catering business. But be all about consistent. Be consistent in everything that you do down to the latch, paratong, spatula, which we got people for that too. But, you know. Just you do the same thing, whether you're delivering 15 person catering today or two weeks from now, it needs to look exactly the same when the customer gets it. That's what they want. That's why I think we've said this before. That's why McDonald's is famous, right? Yeah, McDonald's is famous before. because you 
you get the same exact thing every single time. Now, the problem with today's world is it's wrong half the time. But when I get the Big Mac, the Big Mac is still tastes like a Big Mac, even though it's half the size that it used to be and it costs twice as much. You know who's consistent right? on his complaints about that? You. What? What's that? You're consistent on your complaints about that. I am. I am. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I have an audio clip from another episode that's the exact same sentence. Same exact thing. Yeah. I mean, it just, mm. you can't mess with success, right? We've had success and, and the devil is in the details and that's why. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you can take one thing away besides how much turkey to buy and whatever, be consistent. Yep. And that is the motto for this podcast. Always. Consistency is the key. Consistency is the key. Anything um, else going on? I don't know. I'm yeah. I leave. So next week's episode, we'll have a special guest host, aka most likely Randy Twyford, right? Most likely Randy Twyford. He doesn't know so, that yet, but so everybody can look forward to that. Um, I'm gonna be not so sure, excited. Not sure what we're gonna talk about. Maybe we'll yeah. have a critique emma pod no because emma's still gonna <laughs> i gotta watch <laughs> emma's, it emma, emma's still going to uh i'll decide if i publish that or not <laughs> okay no. i gotta go work on a smoker i gotta go make your prep videos yeah we're doing that so the... trying to be con trying to be consistent we're yeah. we're making a whole line of prep videos for all our because almost all our side dishes are made from scratch Mm -hmm. And in order to keep up with consistency with employees so that everybody's doing it the same exact way, Emma's producing some videos for us and we're shooting videos on how to make all so we can sit down an employee and say, watch this video, then make that video, make that stuff. So we're consistent because consistency is the key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the meantime, right. I'm Yeah. Out. In the meantime, we hit over 100 subscribers on YouTube. But we can't stop there. We're trying for 200 now. So go to YouTube. Yeah, we're trying subscribe for 5,000. Come on. Well, hey, baby steps. Oh. 100 at a time. But okay. uh, go subscribe to us on YouTube at Cue the Mic. Um, so you can yeah watch all these videos. Definitely go watch the one from the Jack. It's just chaotic. Uh, but it's fun. Um, it's fun. We had a lot of fun doing that. Yeah. And then... If you're on YouTube, you can also find us on podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all those. Um, and then you can follow us on Instagram, X, Threads, and TikTok at Cue the Mic. Um, sometimes I post sneak peeks of episodes coming out so you guys can get a is it, little taste is it of what's supposed coming. To be, is it supposed to be X formerly Twitter? Is that how yeah. they formally say that? I don't know. If, it's still Twitter. It's still Twitter. I think I said X this time. Normally, I just say yeah, Twitter. You did. You did. We're improving with the times. Okay. Yeah, I think that's my whole shebang. Oh, and give until us a rating week. if you want. Yeah, yeah until five next stars. Week. If you don't think it's a five star, then call me personally <laughs> and tell me it's why it's not a five star. Yeah, we don't like anything under the five star reviews. Um, but yeah, until next week. Uh, I can't wait to listen to it for the first time as I produce it or as I edit it. It's going to be so much fun. RIP to okay. my ears. Uh, but yeah. Okay. See you guys next week. See ya.